Good morning, everyone, and welcome to 3D Printing, a Supply Chain Revolution. I'm Vinny Civitello, Communications Manager for the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. With us today is Jerry Libertelli of Build Plate Manufacturing. A few housekeeping matters before we get started. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to you tomorrow along with the PowerPoint for today's presentation, so be on the lookout for those. If you can't wait for that email, you can download the PowerPoint right now in the Handouts tab of your GoToWebinar panel. I'd also like to draw your attention to the Questions tab. Jerry would be happy to take all of your questions, so don't hesitate to write them in as they come to you. And I can't stress that enough. Write them in as they come to you, or you might forget what you want to know by the time we hit the Q&A. So now let's get things started. Jerry? Thank you. Um, welcome to 3D printing, a supply chain revolution. I believe that the next manufacturing revolution is going to be on the internet. And uh, today we're going to talk about 3D printing, additive manufacturing, a word that you might have heard. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, why I think it's great, the type of materials that we use uh, in 3D printing, the types of machines that we use, uh, and the types, more importantly, of businesses that it enables. It's very important to note that 3D printing creates an entirely new landscape for how you create your models, how you create product, how you fulfill product. So who am I? Uh, my name is Jerry Libertelli. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur with two services transactions to larger requirers. Uh, I was the first technologist in residence at General Catalyst Partners, a large Boston venture capital fund. And there I was able to see a lot of new technology as it was growing up. Uh, I've done due diligence on over 200 startups. Um, I use my background as an active systems developer, uh, architecting over 85 cloud-based applications to evaluate those technologies uh, for future uh, value. And that's what brings me here. I'm now the founder and CEO of Build Plate Manufacturing in Princeton Junction, New Jersey. It's a 3D printing factory, an additive manufacturing facility, if you will, uh, where we take lots of 3D printers, coordinate them together with a cloud-based application that we architected ourselves, uh, and output real volume from 3D printers. Uh, we can do everything from prototype to produce 500 to 10,000 units of a product or part. Why do I love this space? Well, I'm an investor first and foremost. I have to uh, find spaces that are close to an inflection point, a three to five year inflection point specifically. Um, I got into 3D printing because 3D printing at scale can create a level playing field with countries that utilize raw workforce to compete with us, i.e. China, i.e. Indonesia, uh, countries that create thousand per people uh, factories. Um, 3D printing factories can compete and provide product at the same cost, same uh, production matrix, and the same ability to fulfill. There is currently a gap in service in the manufacturing space for customers that want between 500 and 10,000 units of a part. Uh, right now, if you want this type of work, you have to create a mold uh, most of the time, uh, do a lot of time with design, and then hope that you got it right, uh, sending your unit to China or a overseas concern, uh, and then you get those parts back in hopefully a couple months. You have to take all the bet on the come. Uh, 3D printing changes that, that, that playing field. Um, another thing, reason I love this space is that 3D printing enables mass customization service models. The idea that you can create a custom product on the fly uh, and fulfill that product in a, uh, a, a reasonable amount of time. Um, and most importantly, we can create and enable new startups and new business models with the possibilities that Additive creates. Uh, you can make entirely common products differently. Uh, you can do things like create water channels that make more sense uh, for a certain type of uh, cooling system. Um, this space opens up all uh, creation possibilities. So what is 3D printing really? Well, we all know what 3D printing is, kind of. Um, the idea that you can take a concept that's in your head, design it in a CAD application, apply it to varying types of, of materials, things like plastics, uh, glass, rubber, paper, nylon, metal, and even food, chocolate, uh, 3D print it and prototype it. Now, this is really important because up until 3D printing, you would have to prototype your idea conceptually, do it on paper, you might do it in a CAD application, but you'd never see it in three dimensions and real in your hand. 3D printing allows you to do that within minutes of, of completing a 3D design. Now these designs take a long time, but 3D printing allows you that iterative process that uh, most creative individuals crave. 
And you've probably heard the word additive manufacturing tossed around. Uh, if you're in manufacturing, I know you've heard it. If you're in distribution, you're probably starting to hear it. So it's really just a very simple comparison between the way we used to make things to the way we make things with 3D printers. Subtractive machining is essentially a way of removing material by physical or chemical processing. You might take a block of something, be it metal, wood, what have you, and mill it, turn it, grind it, water jet, cut it, saw it into the thing that you want. This limits the types of work you can do on the geometry of the piece. Uh, additive manufacturing builds the product up from the bottom and adds each layer as it needs it and can create newer types of geometries, better curves, more tolerant uh, fittings. Um, additive manufacturing allows you to take your CAD application and make it real, whereas subtractive machining is more of an art. You have to rely on the machinist's ideas and how that, uh, that occurs. So who uses 3D printing? Well, in my world, businesses who need custom parts quickly. Right now, many of them don't know it, <laughs> but very soon they will. Um, businesses who manufacture products. Uh, there are new and more unique ways to manufacture that product uh, by using a factory like Build Place. People who want unique and custom promotional items. Later on in the presentation, we're going to show you how the mass customization model enables this type of work. And then, as we said, prototyping new ideas and bringing them to life. That is the key unlock of 3D printing and is currently in use all over the place. As we go deeper into it, companies like my own will allow you to take that prototype and start manufacturing small runs of it, enabling a whole new startups uh, that can use do just-in-time manufacturing. So what does a 3D printed part look like? You know, you, depending on your experience with 3D parts, you may have seen 3D printed things that don't look that great. They have lines in them. Sometimes they don't look all that, uh, that uh, ready for, for resale. But what we'd like you to look at is that 3D printed parts can be extremely tolerant from where the where fittings are located, how holes are drilled into the the, the piece. Um, so essentially, they're very good for internal parts to a system. Right now, we can make your your part lighter. We can make it more heat resistant, stronger by using polycarbonates. Uh, this is an example of a polycarbonate piece that's internal to a system, and was done in 20 unit runs for a customer. Uh, as the customer produces more, we jump that to 50. And as they sell down the line, we can go all the way out to 10,000 units for that customer. Now, the real thing that enables me to do this now is, are the materials, not necessarily the machines. There are three different types of machines, and we'll talk about them, but it's really the materials that those machines use that makes it so great. Um, these new materials and hybrids make 3D printing into a real-world application. They can apply directly to your product or service. So the three principal ways of 3D printing, there's, there's variations on these, but these are the principal ones, are fused deposition modeling, stereolithography, and selective laser sintering. These are the most common processes. There are other processes, but these are the most common. My factory uses FDM and SLA. We'd like to use SLS, but that's a very new process. So. When you're using FDM, fused deposition modeling, you have a number of materials that you can choose from now. It used to just be that you could output simple plastic, PLA. That's our principal form right now. Uh, we use PLA in almost everything we do. Um, it's a non-toxic, very simple plastic. It's not very strong. It doesn't necessarily hold up under too much wear, but it makes a nice piece. Um, Stepping up the spectrum, you move into something called ABS, which creates a harder shell and is more heat resistant. Um, these are used in prototype parts, things where you want to mimic the uh, strength of, say, a polycarbonate or something further up the spectrum. Polycarbonates are something that we embrace quite a bit at BuildPlate because they make the best end user parts, and they also print very well. Uh, polycarbonates are uh, create an extremely hard shell. Uh, stiffness and a heat resistance up to 150 degrees in some cases. Um, for example, we're making a part right now for a client that is submerging uh, an optical array in water that is uh, heated to a certain temperature, and they're using polycarbonate to do that. 
Something we also like at, at BuildPlate is TPU. It's a new a material that creates a rubber-like uh, result. Uh, if you've ever seen Adidas shoes or the Nike, new Nike shoes that have a mesh uh, outer, uh, this, more cases than not, is TPU created on a 3D printer. Uh, Adidas uh, most recently is creating an entire new shoe line completely on 3D printers using TPU. Um, and TPU also can be molded in different types of ways, so you can create a almost a leather-like outer to a mesh-like outer. Um, sometimes at BuildPlate, we're a shoe company because of TPU. Um, stereolithography is something that we're very excited about. It's a resin-based platform. It does not use filament as you might have seen it in TV. Filament are those long strings that kind of get extruded into uh, plastic. Stereolithography uses a resin and a laser to cure it on spot in a, uh, in a tank on a build plate. Um, this creates highly intricate and detailed models. When we wanna do outers, uh, things uh, that are outer shells that need to be commercially viable and the like, we use SLA, we don't use FDM. Um, and then finally, there's selective laser sintering. Uh, this is something that we're obviously most excited about because this will enable us to print metal, um, metal parts that have the same strength and resistance as, as metal that you might machine. Now, some of my uh, subtractive manufacturing friends might say that that's not true, um, that some that layered metal parts don't stand up, but I would also argue that geometries and new types of interiors can create that same type of strength. So what does that look like? Uh, what is SLA versus FDM? Here's a great picture of two pieces that were created that are the same piece. One's created in FDM and the other's created in SLA. You'll notice that the FDM piece on the right uh, is a lot more, it it's just doesn't look as accurate as the piece on the left. I would argue that this is mostly because it's a small piece, not because it's FDM particular. FDM has a limit to how small it can create because of the physical geometry that we're working with. Whereas SLA, being more of a mold, a resin-based system, can create these very accurate small details. And a lot of the time at BuildPlay, what we're doing is mixing SLM, uh, SLA and FDM parts together to create the desired effect. We have a Walt Disney-like attention to detail. We don't want to create typical 3D uh, printed uh, parts. We want to create good looking 3D pr printed parts. And that's always a combination of many technologies, not just one. We think, for example, FDM makes better shells. Here's an example of a shell in polycarbonate for that customer we were talking about. Um, you'll notice the lines on the front of the shell are not there because of the 3D printing process. That was from supports that we use to create those intricate overhangs that you see. Um, but you'll notice that we can create a very fine looking shell using FDM. And then if we had to make that look more commercially viable, we might use an SLA coating or an outer. Again, the most exciting technology is SLS, selective laser sintering. This is a picture of a metal piece being built on an SLS machine. Uh, the way this technology works is very unique and different uh, than the other types of technologies, uh, but it, it takes most of its lead from SLA, these laser-based resin uh, that we talked about. Uh, this is an example of a fine metal powder that's laid down on a build plate. Two argon lasers are focused at the same point and kind of spot center that that dust into a metal piece or the first layer of the metal object. This is an example of the first layer being laid down and centered together. When the next layer comes, a arm comes and drops uh, more dust on top of that, and the argon layer go, uh, laser goes to work again and creates the second layer, bonding it to the first layer. Um, SLS, as I said before, is the most exciting thing in our business. And as soon as the pricing on those machines get to production level, you know, you know the build plate and most additive manufacturers will be embracing this in scale. So I've talked about the materials, I've talked about the machines, I've talked about why this is such a great opportunity, but how does this really benefit businesses in the real world? This is the most important thing of, my, of the message I'd like to leave you with today is, you can see how 3D printing can help you by simply looking at your existing processes and thinking further outside the box. Um, additive manufacturing in action can be something as small as creating small internal parts where we used to have machined parts or as big as an entire business customization model wrapped around one type of output. So why is additive manufacturing better? 
these are very obvious ideas, but I want to make sure that I cover them because some folks might not get it right out of the box. Um, I do not have to retool my factory. When I want to make a new pro uh, part, I simply put a new model on the on the printer. I don't have to reset the printer anywhere more than level the build plate and maybe change the, the filament. Um, whereas some factories have to retool the entire factory to create a new piece or part, which can take days, sometimes weeks. Um, at build plate, we simply use a new printer. Um, additive works in a just-in-time format. You can produce what you need when you need it. The reason why this, or I, the reason I believe this has not become a bigger thing uh, in, current, in the current climate is that people just don't think of it like that. The current manufacturing uh, climate requires you to think in terms of inventory and holding large amounts of product and then trying to sell that out over a one year period. Additive manufacturing can change the way you look at that cash flow model. It can change the way that you, the way that you stock product. You can get much more finely detailed about how much product you need to have on hand to fulfill client need uh, and be able to squeeze that level of cash flow back into your own business or your own pocket. Um, the most important thing and something that I'm we're waiting to see unlocked is that additive can do things subtractive just can't do. We can make different types of curves. We can make channels inside of channels. We can create fittings that don't aren't necessarily engineered in a way that Subtractive can support them. Um, these are all things that will be unlocked by the design community as we move forward. And as people see how you can manufacture things additively, they'll also see how you can change the way they're manufactured to be better um, in the design process. So let's take an example of something I think is the most exciting part of uh, additive manufacturing, and that's just-in-time product production for web fulfillment. And let's take the example of a very simple iPhone case. Uh, let's say you have a website that sells iPhone cases um, and you customize these iPhone cases for users as they order them. An example using an additive framework would be that a customer could create a website order, trigger that print via an application programming interface on the build plate or additive factory side, and produce that product as the order comes in, dropping sh drop shipping it directly to the customer from the facility. This is a zero inventory type of business and something that is enabled by an additive factory. Um, in fact, as the person who owns the website, you could have relationships with many additive factories and be able to drop ship based on their turnaround times uh, and the, the amount of time it takes them to produce your product. All of this information is stored digitally and can be transmitted digitally via the internet. So let's say you're not a web app website. Let's say you're a, you're a manufacturing facility that creates an existing product. Here's an example that just in, in time manufacturing can create for your business. Let's say your product is in the first piece, uh, a shell and internal components. Well, the shell is something that you need to produce as inventory because it's got your branding, it's got your logo on it. It's something you have to keep in stock. So you do that. But you don't sell this on a consistent basis. You might sell 20 here, 50 another month, and what have you. You might produce the internal components as you fulfill the product, assemble them just in time, and ship them out to the customer. This is almost a halving of your cash flow situation based on how you used to keep that product in inventory. And that is where additive manufacturing can make a real impact on the bottom line. It doesn't have to be internal components. It could be one component in a piece that you might have to replace fully. Additive manufacturing comes to the rescue when it comes to cash flow retention. And this is because 3D printing is all digital. We make the process fully internet enabled. You can go from virtual to physical and deliver it directly to a drop point without having to get involved in the process other than printing it. Uh, the example that I have to the right there is the inventory. At BuildPlate, we have an application called Inventory Bot, which allows you to print as many copies of a model as you want just by hitting the Print Item button. And we do this with a facility full of 3D printers. They sit in front of a, a a conveyor belt like the one you see here, and as they're completed, they drop down on the conveyor belt with the tagging for where they're drop shipped. They get to the end of the line, a human puts them in a box and ships it out to where they need to go. Uh, a new part comes along, same printer prints the new part. And this is the part I like the most, the mass customization model. We all know 
based on the way business has evolved from the internet and the like, that mass customization is where all product distribution, uh, fulfillment is going. The idea that you can create a product specifically for your customer every single time. Additive manufacturing is, it embodies this idea with the idea that you can create a product on the fly. And so at BuildPlate, we created an example of this. We have a, a, an, a mass customization product called Listing Charms. It's a real estate agent product, which allows a real estate agent to upload a picture of a product they'll be selling, um, maybe an open house coming up on the weekend, and stamp it into a piece of plastic. When you look at this piece of plastic through the light, it creates a very pleasing sepia tone looking picture of the, of the photo that we embedded in the plastic. Um, we package this in a little business card with some brokerage, broker messaging, and we have an, a unique custom promotional product for the broker, which is made on the fly once the person uploads the picture to the website. And this is our Listing Charms website. Um, it's a simple, way to take a picture and turn it into a promotional item quickly. Uh, we do this at BuildPlate a lot because uh, we find that you know people need to see the power of what 3D printing can bring. And uh, this is a wonderful example of mass customization in the model. And so to sum up, additive manufacturing enables mostly real-time manufacturing in any form or format. Uh, the idea that you can create parts of your product or your product as you need it, rather than having to wait and have large inventory suck. Um, prototyping and idea creation, something that 3D printing already enables and is already allowing a whole generation of startups to create uh, new ideas and new product. Uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, the crowdfunding sites are wonderful examples of uh, startups that can now uh, get their product from concept to design uh, so much quicker and, and get funding like uh, for that product right away. And then most importantly, the thing that BuildPlate is here for is new custom manufacturing solutions. The idea that you can create your product differently, make it lighter, more heat resistant, stronger. Uh, the, all of these are enabled by changing the way that you build that product using 3D printing. And that is my presentation. I uh, hope that you uh, have found it interesting. Um, materials, as you know, it's just as a way to sum up, materials are the most important part of the 3D printing equation, something that can enable your product or business. Uh, but most importantly also that this is a digital technology, that this is something that where we're taking in an old school way of building things and moving it into the digital. And so that enables, uh, like the internet, and enables things such as new ideas for the product creation itself. That's the most important piece. But if you have any questions, I'd love to take them from you now. Thanks, Jerry. It looks like we have a couple already, but I want to give everyone a moment to type in anything they might have. So while I'm doing that, I'll take a second to remind you about the handouts tab. Uh, we get a lot of questions from people about how to download the PowerPoint slides. So just open up the tab marked handouts in your go-to webinar panel and the file is right there. You can also just wait until tomorrow and they'll be emailed to you with the video recording of today's webinar. There's also the questions tab. If you have a question, type it in right there and I'll make sure Jerry answers it. And don't be shy. You've got an expert here, so make sure you take advantage of them. It's always so disappointing when I look at the post-webinar evaluation survey and people say, oh, I wish he touched on this or I came to hear more about that or uh, it was you know, way under my head. I was hoping he'd get a little bit more technical. Here's your chance. Ask anything you'd like of Jerry. He'd love to answer your question. So with that, I'm going to go with the first question that we have that came in, which comes from Peter, who asks, how long does it take to print most things? Well, that is the key question for anybody who's used a 3D printer. Um, the answer is hours in many cases. So that is why people like myself have created these factories of printers. Um, we're we're go gaming for 100 at build plate. You know, we don't have 100 yet, but we're getting there. Um, but what we try to do is marshal lots of printers printing the same product at the same time. This allows us to build a, a critical scale for a customer and be able to pump out 500 of something whereas uh, as, as opposed to one. But the idea is we use multiple printers 
controlled by a custom cloud application that we built, uh, which knows when the next print is available and always finds the most available printer for the next print. So our factory is like the most efficient factory in China. We just always wind up getting to the next thing quick as, as quick as possible. Robert asks, how about medical parts, examples, hips, knees, et cetera? Well, this is also a business we're, we're focused on quite quite a bit at uh, Build Plate, and this is the SLA space that we talked about, the stereolithography space. It's mostly dental right now. Um, we make things like surgical guides. Uh, we do visualizations for dentists where we might create a large uh, model of someone's mouth. Um, the surgeon can essentially try their procedure out before they actually get into the person's mouth, and that's that's quite exciting. We've also um, made models models of limbs for uh, surgeons who are attempting a complicated surgery. We'll do a scan of the broken pieces of the limb. Uh, the surgeon can then take a 3D model and figure out how those join together. So it's mostly in the areas of visualization. We do have some call for actual pieces that go into the body though. Um, probably the most important thing that we've seen is uh, these bioprinters that we saw at uh, Rapid this year. Rapid is a uh, convention that all of the 3D printing shops go to. Um, these are real bioprinters. They're not necessarily legal in the United States yet, but they take an emulsion of uh, a user's uh, stem cells and can do things like print an ear, print tissue, uh, print various pieces that theoretically should match the donor because we're using their stem cells. Um, this is currently happening in Sweden and in Europe in some places. Most of these printers come from Europe, um, but we're anxiously waiting for that to happen, yes. Very cool. So Beth asks, tell me more about the metal printing, and I'm going to have a follow-up to that when sure. you're done. Sure. Metal printing is clearly the, uh, the final... Um, stake in the uh, coffin for uh, subtractive manufacturing. Being able to present uh, pr uh, print real metal parts means that we can structurally get into in areas that we haven't been able to get into yet. Uh, the automotive, uh, things that require high heat ten uh, tension, high tolerance. Um, and so metal printing really is the, uh, the final piece, which makes us a full manufacturing facility. Um, for example, uh, GE is a leader in this space. Uh, they make printers, they use printers, and uh, they've made ball bearings, for example, uh, that have circuits and uh, circuitry actually embedded in the ball bearing. So each ball bearing can report back their heat status, their uh, viscosity of the oil that's surrounding them. Um, it's a smart ball bearing. And so essentially metal printing and additive together is going to enable the creation of smart devices, devices that look inanimate but are reporting their status to you on, on a frequent basis. All right, so my follow-up to that is the chocolate. So are you guys designing the mold or is it actually you know, melting and then cooling the chocolate to make a device or something out of that? that that's a great question. So now uh, food is different. Now food is something that typically does not taste good when it's created with a 3D printer, but chocolate is different. Now, chocolate can obviously be extruded. Um, you can move chocolate through the same type of uh, thing that we move all of the filament through. So chocolate allows us to kind of create very, we don't do chocolate at Build Plate, but uh, of the chocolate printers that I've seen, yes, you literally build a chocolate model layer by layer. You can use different types of chocolate with multiple extruders um, and make quite a masterpiece. Um, also, you also see kind of a, a modification on this. Uh, if you've ever gotten a cake and the cake had had a picture of someone made in the frosting, that's a similar type of what we call gantry technology that almost works more like a laser etcher, etching where it kind of creates that picture and frosting on top of the cake. So um, yes, chocolate is real and there is such a thing as a food printer, um, but I had a taste of the food and it really isn't something that you want to eat right now. I can imagine. All right, so we don't have any more audience questions, but I am going to ask one more just to see if anybody's got time to type in anything else. Um, on a more serious note, so I have great skills in, let's say, Photoshop, um, 2D design, but the thing that's always held me back from buying a 3D printer is I have no idea how I would go from you know taking my 2D design and getting it into something that this machine could actually spit out. So what would you say would be your advice to somebody like me that would want to get started? 
I would say please come to our business first and foremost because our business suffers greatly from the same thing. I was involved in the web application development space back in 1999 and the same problem existed then. We had people who wanted to build the technology but just didn't have the skill set to get there. But we had a lot of very smart people who wanted to get there. And so now we have those same folks who have graphics uh, skills and they understand Photoshop and the like and we need 3D, 3D designers in the additive business. And so the beautiful thing has happened that Google has created a pro program called SketchUp, which is a wonderful first step for graphics designers to move from Photoshop into the 3D modeling world. But just to come, step back a little bit and talk about the process, um, a designer or an engineer in this particular case builds a CAD model computer-aided design model. This is a three-dimensional model that's built in programs like SolidWorks. Um, Fusion 360 is another example of a professional modeling application, uh, and this application SketchUp that I just uh, mentioned. Um, and in this application, you can build a three-dimensional representation of almost anything you can think of. Um, it's a wonderful next step for people who understand Photoshop at a very, very basic level. Um, once you create your 3D model, that has to be prepared for the uh, the 3D printer. 3D CAD is not necessarily made simply for 3D printing. Sometimes architects use it, obviously, to build representations of what they're building. Um, uh, it can be used in product development for packaging, things like that. So the 3D modeling suites don't necessarily just say 3D printing. It opens up a whole world of design to somebody who's moving from Photoshop. But when you're using it for a 3D printer, you take your CAD model and you create something called an STL. Uh, that's a, uh, app, a, a file that was created by a slicer application. There's an application called Slicer, and then there's something called Cura, and there's various types of slicers out there. But once you run your CAD application, CAD model, through the slicer, it's ready for 3D printing. Um, and there's a number of settings you have to create uh, in order to make the 3D printer work appropriately for your model. Like, for example, if your model has a big arch in it, um, if you think about how a 3D printer would print that out, you'd need some sort of support to go underneath the arch as it's creating it layer by layer. And so supports are something that you'd have to learn how to do um, once you create your CAD uh, model. But the thing I wanna definitely say to you and to anybody who's considering is that this is a wonderful next step. I'm sure many times you've looked at a two-dimensional graphic that you've created in Photoshop and thought to yourself, wouldn't it be great to be able to actually see this in practice? Well, CAD is the next step for that, and that's something that I encourage every designer to explore because there's a, a very large need in people who can use these applications. Uh, companies like my own are going to be utilizing people like that in greater mass as time goes on. Every customer that we get wants to utilize 3D printing, but only 40% of them actually have the CAD models that they need to print them. So a lot of the times we need to match them together with a designer. And that's why my company actively fosters creating uh, people who do that. Uh, I had to do it when we built web applications. I feel like we'll do it now as well. Um, but yes, it's a, it's a, it's a, not a sh it's not a long course to get there, and it's something that you could absolutely move from Photoshop or uh, a, a 2D um, creation suite and move directly into 3D printing from there. It's a, it's a great career. All right, so I've got one more question because this is the kind of topic that's infinitely interesting to me. So you buy a regular paper printer, mm -hmm. and the thing that they always get you with is the ink. So in this case, the ink is like your rubber and your plastic and your metal. So what's the process like for getting a hold of that stuff? That is a, that is a very good question um, because we have problems with that in this business. Um, materials or being able in my business, for example, if I have to do 5,000 units of something, you have to get a lot of material obviously to do that. And we face regular shortages in the 3D printing business. There aren't enough people making filaments and materials uh, or they're not doing it in mass. Um, and so what I do, it, to answer your question, it's very expensive. Um, the average cost of a roll of filament is between $59 and $69 retail. If you have a relationship, you can get that down to the $49 area. The resin that we talked about is much more expensive. And then the metal powder that we're talking about is even more expensive than that. Clearly, that is an unlock that we have to change in order to get the price of these pieces down to an area where we want to compete with overseas manufacturing. And so Build Plate does a lot there. Um, 
our biggest problem is resin. We have a hard time uh, fulfilling orders uh, that come in for our SLA products because we can't get enough resin. And so what we've done is made a partnership with a resin production company to create resin that is specific to our machines. Um, my son is an engineer at Penn State, and he has come to help me, and he's our resident resin chemical expert. Uh, and so he is essentially off formulating resin that works well with our SLA printers so that we can secure a future source of material. And, you know, it, it harkens back to the time when, uh, during our own manufacturing revolution when, um, you know, people like Carnegie were trying to create steel and needed to get the raw materials to do it. Um, we are in that type of a moment in 3D printing where even the people who embrace 3D printing may not be able to take advantage of it because of their inability to get the materials. And so every good factory um, is out there securing materials at the same time that they're securing machines and like. Very good question. It's it's a principal problem for us. All right. Well, that looks like all the questions that we have. So I think it's as good a time as any to bring it to a close. Um, don't forget, all of you will be receiving a recording of today's webinar and the PowerPoint slides via email. Lastly, when you close out of the webinar, a survey will come up on your screen that we hope you'll fill out so we can understand how to best provide you important information in a webinar format. Our next webinar, Save Money on Mandatory New Jersey Disability Insurance, will take place Wednesday, June 6th. So by all means, feel free to register for that one right on our homepage at njbia.org, and we will see you there. So until next time, for Jerry Libertelli, this is Vinny Civitello thanking you for being with us this morning and wishing you a great day.